before Dave and Kellen get here, quick word from me, Jacob Black. I just want to say right at the top that I did nothing wrong. Sometimes you're just trying to kill a baby and then you fall in love with the baby and it's totally chill and normal. Today's book is Breaking Dawn by my mommy, Stephanie Meyer. <laughs> and this is The Book Pile. I'm Kellen Erskine. I'm a comic, a father, and unlike Edward and Bella, I had a very modest wedding because I didn't marry into old vampire money. <laughs> and I'm David Vance. Uh, sorry I'm late. Was the intro good? <laughs> I read Breaking Dawn right while I was watching Breaking Bad. They're both stories about people doing horrible things, but only one of them knows that. As always, please leave us uh, an amazing review. Darkwater4213 says, Has long been one of my favorite podcasts. Absolutely recommend it, especially if you hate books. Uh, but I don't, so what do I know? That's uh, <laughs> such an interesting way to phrase it, because it makes it sound like, Hey, do you hate books? So do these guys, which is not true other than today. All right, if you want to see me live, there's a quick rundown. Listen for your state. May 6th, I'll be in Austin, Texas. On June 15th, I'm in Mill Valley, California. July 7th to the 8th, St. Paul. July 9th, Mondovi, Wisconsin. And December 9th through the 10th, get your tickets now. I'll be in Des Moines, <laughs> Iowa. Go to KellenErskine.com. Speaking of my shows, I need to give a shout-out to Mike and Evelyn. Happy 19th birthday, Evelyn. And actually, I apologize. I don't remember if your dad's name was Mike, but I know it was something with one syllable. They drove three hours to see me at this random wow. town in Wisconsin last week at this comedy club that was like in the attic of a sports pub. There were 25 people there, but it was still a Holy blast. Cow. And thanks so much for coming all the way out there, you two. Now, at the end of this episode, we're going to play Desert Island, where at least one of us will list the top seven movies we'd keep if we were stranded on an island. And let us know in the YouTube comments what your seven movies would be. Finally, our next two books are Shoe Dog and Story of Your Life and Others. Okay, how to describe this book? <laughs> Kellen, have you ever met the most PDA couple in your life and thought, I hope they tell me all about their first time? <laughs> <laughs> this book begins, as all great YA novels do, with a teenager getting married. <laughs> Classic story, old rich criminal man meets girl, old rich criminal man gets girl when she's 18. <laughs> but they have traditional values, so Edward waits till after they're married to drink her blood. <laughs> then, somehow, when Stephanie Meyer describes the honeymoon, she has both too much shame and too little shame. <laughs> She's so coy that she only uses euphemisms, but then she does not stop. Yeah. But, Kellen, what did you think? <laughs> I mean, credit where credit's due. Compared to the first three books, this one finally evolves from toxic, inaccurate advice on teenage relationships to giving toxic, inaccurate advice on mental health, marriage, and parenting. <laughs> Dave and I were talking beforehand, and I was like, the best way I can describe it is like, I've never been so bored having to slog through 20 hours of a book, yeah. but then also walked away with way too much material for an episode of the podcast. Uh -huh. <laughs> I thought that about myself. Like, I will listen to a 20 hour terrible book to make fun of it for 20 minutes for the approval of these strangers I will never meet. <laughs> And I'm still not as needy and desperate as Edward. I have so much to learn from him. All right. And without further ado, this is part one of The Roast of Breaking Dawn in four lessons. All right. Lesson one. Build your story to have the most potentially exciting and interesting climax of a series that's already had three messes and then completely drop the ball like it's on purpose. <laughs> and to be preemptive with any Breaking Dawn apologies, Stephanie Meyer isn't subverting a genre. She's subverting good writing. This story, <laughs> in a nutshell, is that human Bella gets married to vampire Edward, gets pregnant on her honeymoon, 
Her unborn child grows super fast, but isn't that what everyone says who comes back from their honeymoon with a baby mump? <laughs> the baby almost kills her at birth, so Edward makes her a vampire to save her, which is something you probably would have learned if you hadn't quit med school, Dave. Jacob <laughs> falls in love with their baby. The upper management vampires hear about this forbidden hybrid baby, so they gather an army. And then Bella and her vampire family also gather an army who all have unique superhero skills, and both sides meet to have this end game battle and then they just come to an agreement and go their separate ways and it's like <laughs> what about like this new vampire character who can cook popcorn with his bare hands like you <laughs> you just wanted me to meet that guy you built them up for nothing <laughs> someone told me that the the movie fixes the ending so i just watched the end of the movie <laughs> it's interesting we actually do get to see this battle the bad guys start losing and everything falls apart for them and then it all just sort of rewinds into one of the villains heads to let him know like yeah that's what would have happened <laughs> and he's like okay let's not fight <laughs> And then the whole thing rewinds into our heads and says, that's what would have happened if Twilight were real. <laughs> Diplomacy is what you want in the real world, but not in your story. <laughs> not the thing that's been building up to this final battle. It's crazy, too, because Stephanie Meyer obviously knows that one of the building blocks of an intriguing story is conflict. And there is conflict in all of her stories it's lame, artificial, <laughs> not believable, but it's still <laughs> conflict. So then to get to the biggest conflict of all the books and be like, you know what? Peace is better. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine the final battle in Lord of the Rings in the, in the Return of the King. We get this you know, view from 20,000 feet of these armies colliding. And the moment they hit, they just all start shaking hands. <laughs> and the movie's over. <laughs> Every Twilight climax is like her teacher told her to write a climax and she put it off till the night before. <laughs> She's like, oh, uh, oh, crap. Uh, suddenly the bad vampires were back <laughs> and they were easily defeated. <laughs> now back to the kissing. <laughs> <laughs> and then in this sort of like, and then the Volturi grabbed the microphone. Imagine all the people. <laughs> Lesson two. Characters do not have to be perfect or smarter than a bird. <laughs> all right, let's do an experiment. If you are near a photo of yourself, look at it right now. If you're not, just imagine looking at it. I'm going to assume when you look at this photo that you are not confused. Now here's our girl, Bella. The image was also wrong somehow. I almost recognized my own face in it, but it was off, backward. I grasped quickly that I was seeing my face as others saw it, rather than flipped in a reflection. <laughs> I read that and was like, why stop there? Why not write some more? <laughs> I spent the first five minutes trying to fight it, like a gorilla would. This exhausted me. Next, I looked at our family photo. Who's this tramp with Edward? I tried to eat the photo. Distraught, I ran into a mirror maze. Half of them were me, but who's the other half? Finally, Edward made me a vampire, so there's no one in the mirror maze, but now I keep crashing into the walls. Anyways, I hope I figure this all out before I start college at Dartmouth. <laughs> Bella's personality used to be that she's clumsy, but now that she's a vampire, her personality pivoted to doesn't understand photos. <laughs> or another explanation is that Bella has the world's most asymmetrical face. <laughs> another Bella line. The pain was bewildering. Exactly that. I was bewildered. <laughs> yes, imbecile. That's the only definition of bewilder. <laughs> Your wordplay is truly playing on words. Bella knows Jacob is going to be hunted by vampires and he needs a fake passport to lay low. So she gives him the name Jacob Wolf. <laughs> In another life, Bella is a witness protection case agent who just gets every client killed. She's like, congratulations, Donnie. Your new identity is Donnie the Rat. 
<laughs> I got you a job working at a gun range, and for your emergency contact, I just put the mob. <laughs> Like Lee Harvey Oswald runs for the border, he makes it. <laughs> and they see his passport as Lee Harvey shot JFK. There's that thing, dramatic irony, where the author lets the audience know more than the characters because it's fun to see, like, ooh, when will the characters figure this out? Mm -hmm. Stephanie Meyer does that, not by giving the reader more info than the characters, but by making the characters so much stupider than the reader. <laughs> So Bella is shocked at every obvious twist, like that she's pregnant and Jacob's a werewolf and Alice isn't a traitor, even though we all see it coming. Mm -hmm. And when it happens, I really want to know what Stephanie Meyer said to herself. Because she either said, oh yeah, the readers are stupid. Or she said, they won't care that I make Bella stupid. Or <laughs> I'm stupid. <laughs> Last one. After Bella's a vampire, she says, I didn't know how to cry in this body. I couldn't do anything but stare. There was no feeling yet. That's not the new body, Bella. <laughs> in this new body, I was a boring, lifeless damsel who made no choices. That's like I become a vampire and I'm like, now I have a breathy laugh. I bring up Harry Potter too much. Suddenly I need to sell a 2013 Toyota Corolla. <laughs> Lesson three, it's never too late to decide one of your main characters is the funny one. For three books, Jacob Black is not funny. Then in book four, he's not, but boy does Stephanie try. Oh, he is. Here are actual punchlines said by Jacob Black. <laughs> First one, bippity boppity boo. <laughs> Yeah, you know how actual 17-year-old boys go straight to the 1950 classic Cinderella when they're <laughs> yeah. razzing their friends. Second Jacob punchline, bada bing. <laughs> Man, when did these become Marvel movies, am I right? So funny. When Bella is the narrator, her chapter titles are things like new, burning, surprise, which sounds like she caught something on the honeymoon. Now here are actual <laughs> Jacob chapter titles. You know things are bad when you feel guilty for being rude to vampires. <laughs> Very strong Will Smith's parents just don't understand energy. <laughs> Another one. What do I look like? The Wizard of Oz? You need a brain? You need a heart? Go ahead. Take mine. Take everything I have. That's a chapter title. <laughs> Stephanie Meyer also has him for some reason just go through this string of old like blonde jokes <laughs> oh, yeah. you know, he just every time he he sees is it rosalind this blonde character Rosalie, he's just yeah. like hey ever heard this one and he just rattles off something that sounds like it was written by like the Mad Men. it's insane <laughs> Like, at one point, he throws a bowl of food at her head and calls her a dumb blonde. It's like we're supposed to hate him. Like, I don't understand what, what the point of any of that is. I think he's supposed to be the, like, jokey other guy, and we're still supposed to care about him, which does not explain why there's a moment when he's just straight up about to kill a baby. <laughs> it's so... <laughs> like, he's a comic relief. You remember when Han Solo would, you know, just, like throw a sandwich at Princess Leia. How <laughs> hilarious that was. Like, what character would you let come back from trying to kill a baby? <laughs> you wouldn't read it and think, I bet this guy has a team. I bet people are team this guy. <laughs> All right. Lesson four, publish your rough draft. That's that's the excuse that I'm giving this book. It's like your editor's only advice was, don't cut anything. It's perfect. I'm going on vacation. We love it. <laughs> this, this book was a 20-hour listen, but it could have started at the five-hour mark. No exaggeration. This sentence would cover the whole book up to that point. After I married Edward, I found out I was pregnant with a half-human, half-vampire. It's an interesting first line, right? It would literally cut out 25% of the book. And Dave, you know that I'm more forgiving of a slow story as long as the prose is good. I know I've never mentioned this before, but 
<laughs> Grapes of Wrath provides a glimpse to living in a, a post-Depression Oklahoma wasteland, which I find interesting because I've never done that before. But this book, I mean, guess what, Stephanie? I've been to a wedding, <laughs> and there is no more boring of a way to spend a Saturday than at a wedding for people that you don't really know. And that's exactly what she does to us. <laughs> During the first seven chapters, none of the narrative moves forward. There's no new characters or character revelations, but we do find out what Bella's dress looks like what the venue looks like, what the decorations look like, who Bella dances with, and guess what? Bonus, Jacob shows up and he still hates Edward. So get in the back seat, Steinbeck. <laughs> well, it does go through my favorite wedding traditions like the bouquet toss, Cotton Eye Joe, and the part where the bride goes off into the shadows to share an intimate dance with the guy she friend-zoned as he gets angry that she's going to sleep with her husband on her honeymoon. <laughs> I will also say that if you skipped the wedding and honeymoon, it would be efficient storytelling, but like 20 million 50-year-old women would have been so disappointed. <laughs> I needed to see this in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I need to see him eat the headboard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the whole, the honeymoon stuff is so bizarre to me, too. Aside from the, like, actual abuse that happens that's painted as romantic, that uh, is just such a terrible message. You know, the next day when Bella's like, oh, my arms and legs are all bruised, didn't even notice, doesn't even hurt. It was perfect. She <laughs> describes it as perfect. And I was just like, how how are we letting like any young women <laughs> read this? Be like, can't wait for that normal thing to happen to me. But aside from that, there's also this weird thing where they don't even really like remember what happened. It's like there's feathers all over the place and Edward's like, Yeah, I bit some pillows. And it's like, Bella you don't remember when you guys were like making out on top of each other and then all of a sudden he was eating a pillow? You're not going to remember that sort of thing. He was actively choking on the down. <laughs> the other thing, on the honeymoon, Edward keeps refusing to sleep with Bella because he's worried he might eat her because I guess he's a praying mantis. <laughs> so with all this, I'm just surprised that Stephanie Meyer's editor didn't at least suggest labeling the first 170 pages as a prologue. <laughs> I can't overstate this enough. Nothing happens in the time that it takes to tell two entire the old man in the seas. <laughs> I don't know what the plural is, two uh, old men in the sea. I actually came here wanting to play a game with you, so let's actually play it right now. Sure. Kellen, we've now read all the Twilight books. And I want to look back and play a game when you cut out all the angst. I want to see if we can remember in each book things that actually happened. <laughs> so the game is called What Actually Happened? <laughs> so let's try it. So book one, what okay. do we remember that actually happened? Uh, Bella thinks Edward hates her. Uh, she finds out he doesn't. They date. We find out Jacob's a werewolf. Is that? It's not this one. That oh, okay. would be too much. <laughs> That's how much it's they not. blend together. And then a bad vampire tries to kill her uh, for reasons. Yeah. And then the Collins kill him. All right, book two. Edward leaves. She strings Jacob along. Edward comes back. Is that the one where at some point they're like camping, the three of them? And she has to share a sleeping bag with Jacob because he's warm and Edward is cold. No. It's no? not that one. That would be too many things. Oh, <laughs> is that, that a That would eclipse? be too many events. That's a is, eclipse. Is that why it's called Eclipse? Because Jacob's body gets between Bella's and Edward's? <laughs> <laughs> all right, Eclipse. That is like all I remember. I remember that scene. I remember that all these murders are happening again off screen and mm -hmm. the Collins do nothing. <laughs> and then she chooses Edward just like she's chosen him in every single book. I've said this before. I've never seen a more asymmetrical love triangle because every book, Edward gets put on a higher and higher pedestal 
and Jacob gets kicked down another flight of stairs. <laughs> All right, this has been a game of what actually happened. <laughs> that is wild to me that each of these books is between 16 and 20 hours of content, and I, uh, for the life of me, cannot remember. <laughs> well, because most of it is just angst. Mm, most mm-hmm. of it is angst without action. She just feels things and does nothing. <laughs> I remember they played baseball in the first one and then just never did that again. <laughs> yeah, they played baseball while listening to Muse. <laughs> I went and saw the first movie when my wife and I were dating. And I remember thinking that that part was cool. And then afterwards I was like, nah, I just think that song is cool. <laughs> When I was a teenager, I was driving with a friend and I asked her if I could play some Muse. And she's like, oh, I've never met someone who likes Muse. What? <laughs> and I, I withered into a raisin. <laughs> she wasn't trying to diss. She was so intellectually curious. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, we were on our way to a Jack Johnson concert. Oh. So <laughs> different worlds. <laughs> I don't know why I was wanting to play Muse to or from a Jack Johnson concert. Maybe it's like how when you're at a candle shop, you sniff coffee to reset the palate. (laughs) I hope you had one in the chamber for when you put on that first Muse song and she's like, I don't think these guys are very good. And you would have been like, who's to say? (laughs) I wish I could have clubbed her with a banana pancake. (laughs) Jack Johnson was my first major concert, and it was eye-opening to me because I was like, oh, a concert is just their songs I already know, but worse, (laughs) and mixed in with the songs that I usually skip, and I can't do anything while I listen. (laughs) Oh, cool. Like, I can't hear it that well, but at least the 30,000 people around me remember the lyrics. Thanks, everyone. (laughs) Yeah. All right, this is our first two-part episode, meaning that we had so many jokes to share about this book that we couldn't fit them all in one. So make sure to download the continuation of this roast on next week's episode, part two of The Roast of Breaking Dawn. So now we'll close out this episode with that game of Desert Island. If you crashed on a desert island, what seven movies would you bring if they were all you could watch for the rest of your life? And again, any, any listeners, tell us your seven in the YouTube comments. Okay, let me see if I can guess yours. Okay, The Goonies. <laughs> no, I would guess Star Wars. Yeah. Indiana Jones. The third one, yes. Sorry, another rule is you can pick series, like within reason. Okay, well, half of Indiana Jones sucks, so I don't pick the whole series. <laughs> okay. So yeah, my other ones would be, man, top of the list. Um, I've mentioned before that like the three-way tie at the top is Emma, Inception, and uh, It's a Wonderful Life. Probably Coco. Mm, Great one. And then also um, the movies that have made me feel the most emotions, like all of Mm. the emotions are probably Little Women, uh, Greta Gerwig's Little Women, and then uh, a movie called Belfast. And then also uh, Pocahontas, too, when she goes to visit England. (laughs) (laughs) And John Smith sings a beautiful song about the Industrial Revolution. (laughs) Till you build with the sweat of the proletariat. (laughs) Till you enclose the land of the agrarian poor. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You think the only people who can work are adults. (laughs) The ones who are just as tall as you. (laughs) But if you take a moment to look down, (laughs) you will find that little children are people too. (laughs) The baby and the elderly are my employees. (laughs) I'm trying to make the higher-ups my friends. (laughs) Can you sing on the assembly line instead of go to school? (laughs) 
Can you die an early death of overexertion? <laughs> Have you made a giant empire? And then when Germany tries to do it, you're like, no, not like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this seems like a, an appropriate place to stop. <laughs> Thanks again for listening. And remember to check out the rest of this roast next week. And to recap today, one, when it comes to endings, drop the ball. Two, characters don't have to be smarter than a bird. Three, it's never too late to decide one of your characters is the funny one. Four, publish your rough draft. And five, remember to tune in next week for part two where we've got a hundred more jokes about this insane book. <laughs>